Hello guys. Today we are going to discuss Charles Dickens's novel Hard Times. Charles Dickens was perhaps the most popular among the Victorian novelists. Victorian era was a golden age of English fiction. The other major novelists of the period included Mary Ann Evans, who adopted the pseudonym George Eliot, Thomas Hardy and the Bronte sisters. Many of Dickens's novels were originally published in serialized form in weekly or monthly installments. He wrote the episodes as the novels were being serialized. He also revised plot and character after receiving the readers responses. Dickens's novels are known for their meticulous realism, florid prose, witty comedy, vivid characterization and above everything else social criticism. They have also attracted criticism for their loose plot endings, incredible coincidences and for being sentimental and melodramatic. Dickens's novels have a larger than usual autobiographical component. So a brief account of the author's life and career will help us better understand his works. Charles Dickens was born in 1812 at Landport, England as the second of the eight children of John and Elizabeth Dickens. His father was a clerk in the Navy pay office. When Charles was only four, the family moved to Chatham in Kent and later to London. As a child, he possessed a photographic memory, which proved helpful in his career as a novelist. Most of the characters and life situations in Dickens's novels are borrowed from either his own or his family's experiences. Soon the family ran into financial difficulties and his father was imprisoned in the Marshalsea prison. Dickens uses this prison as a setting for Little Dorrit. Young Charles had to leave school and work in a blacking factory, pasting labels on pots of boot blacking for a meager six shillings a week. No wonder we find many young boys in brutal and miserable conditions in Dickens' novels. The righteous indignation at these personal experiences became the basis for Dickens' sympathy for the poor and advocacy of social reform. Dickens worked as a law clerk and a reporter before he became a novelist. His journalistic career produced the first of his major works, a collection called Sketches by Boz, published in 1836. This was followed by the novels The Pickwick Papers, Oliver Twist, Nicholas Nickleby and The Old Curiosity Shop. He married Catherine Hogarth in 1836 with whom he had 10 children. Dickens's emotional attachment to her sister Mary and her death are fictionalized in the old curiosity shop. Dickens made several trips to the United States, met American literary figures of the time, such as Washington Irving and Ralph Waldo Emerson, spoke in support of the abolition of slavery and campaigned for copyrights. A Christmas Carol came out in 1843, Dombey and Son in 1846, and Little Dorrit in 1857. A Tale of Two Cities, his best-selling novel built around the French Revolution and Great Expectations, a novel of education, like his early young man novels, are major works of his later years. The novels written after 1845 are more serious in theme. They are also better crafted as works of art. Dickens's best known works include Great Expectations, David Copperfield, Oliver Twist, A Tale of Two Cities, Bleak House, Nicholas Nickleby, The Pickwick Papers, and A Christmas Carol. Dickens also formed a lasting and deep bond with actress Ellen Ternan. His last novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, remains unfinished. Having suffered two strokes, Dickens died in 1870. Perhaps the most important characteristic of Charles Dickens' novels is their deep humanitarianism. 
The contribution of Dickens's fiction to the much needed social criticism was recognized by none other than Karl Marx. Dickens satirized the English legal system in Bleak House, the oppressive family in David Copperfield, the educational system in David Copperfield, Nicholas Nickleby and Hard Times, and the so-called charitable institutions in Oliver Twist. His social commentary was so effective that it produced actual reform. The shocking images of poverty and crime in Oliver Twist shocked the reader so much that it led to the clearing of the London slum called Jacob's Island. Today, a century and a half after his death, Dickens remains the most read of English authors. The novel Hard Times was serialized in 1854 in Dickens' weekly Household Words. It sold well and appeared in book form in the same year. Hard Times is unique in several respects. It is the shortest of Dickens' novels. It is his only novel-length study of the industrial working class. Dickens uses both vitriol and satire to illustrate the condition of this marginalized social stratum. The workers were called hands by factory owners. This means that they were not considered as human beings but only as appendages to the machines they operated. The story of Hard Times is set in a fictitious industrial town called Coketown. Coketown is similar to Manchester. Critics believe that Coketown is based on 19th century Preston. Let us now look at the historical and intellectual background of the novel and the way in which the novel engages it. By the middle of the 19th century, after the advent of the Industrial Revolution, Britain had become the world's major economic and political power. But the nation's rise to the status of a political power and an economic powerhouse did not benefit the entire population. Dickens highlights the poor and the disadvantaged who are forgotten and champions their cause. He treats class divides between mill owners and industrial workers. He also deals with the trade union problems. He also takes up uh, the pessimism that sent in after the Industrial Revolution. One of Dickens' targets in hard times is a school of thought called utilitarianism. The founders of utilitarianism were Jeremy Bentham and James Mill, father to the political theorist and philosopher John Stuart Mill. Utilitarianism believed that general social good was the ultimate goal of both individuals and society in general. The principles of utilitarianism are summarized in Jeremy Bentham's words, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. To Dickens, utilitarianism was a selfish philosophy of over-rationalization. In England, in practice, it combined with materialist laissez-faire capitalism and caused immense misery in England. According to Dickens, its evil effects could be felt in both industrial practices and in the education of children. As far as the industrial situation was concerned, this philosophy widened the gulf between the rich and the poor, between mill owners and their undervalued workers. In the field of education, it overemphasized the facts and neglected the growth of emotional and imaginative faculties of children. In real life, John Stuart Mill had a rigorous education similar to that of Louisa Gradgrind in Hard Times, consisting of analytical, logical, mathematical and statistical exercises. In his 20s, Mill had a nervous breakdown. Mill felt that the stringent emphasis on analytical and mathematical exercises in his education had weakened his capacity for emotion. In the novel Hard Times, Louisa is unable to express her emotions. 
she falls into a temporary depression as a result of her dry education the novel hard times follows a classical tripartite structure that is it is divided into three parts book 1 is entitled sowing book 2 is called reaping and book 3 is called garnering these titles are of course agricultural metaphors metaphorically they seem to emphasize the consequences of human actions in the novel these titles denote the consequences of the social and educational policies followed in 19th century england let us now discuss the plot of the novel hard times when book 1 opens we see a character called mr gradgrind he is a retired merchant and a dictatorial educationist he states the dictum which dickens criticizes now what i want is facts he is a man of facts and calculations he questions one of his pupils sissy jupe whose father is involved with the circus for gradgrind the circus represents fancy as opposed to fact of which he is a proponent sissy's father rides and looks after horses mr gradgrind offers sissy a definition of horse she is rebuffed for not being able to define a horse factually another pupil bitsa is able to define a horse in factual zoological terms according to gradgrind's ideal of education sissy jupe is a bad pupil he censures her for thinking imaginatively she is exhorted to disregard fancy altogether all that you require is facts according to mr gradgrind louisa and thomas mr gradgrind's children return from a tour of the circus run by slary this disturbs their father a lot because according to mr gradgrind the circus is the bastion of fancy the names of mr gradgrind's other children are quite suggestive one of the children is named adam smith the laissez faire theorist and the father of modern economics another child is called thomas maltus the population theorist mr gradgrind's boss is josea bounderby an affluent manufacturer and mill owner bounderby prides himself as a self-made man who rose from the gutter as a result of his enterprise and capital mr gradgrind and bounderby visit the public house in which sissy jupe stays Sissy was abandoned by her father because he wanted her to lead a better life without him. Gradgrind and Bounderby give her a choice: either to return to the circus and forfeit her education, or to continue her education and never to return. They do not want the free ideas from the circus to disseminate in the school. They do not want fancy and freedom to contaminate. the rational ambiance of the school sissy leaves the circus and her friends but she hopes that one day she will be reunited with her father tom and louisa are repressed and disappointed with their life we see them discussing their feelings and their lost childhood we also meet the mill workers known as the hands one of them is steven blackpool a hard working man of great integrity We see him walking home with his companion Rachel whom he wishes to marry one day. We also see his drunken wife giving him an unpleasant welcome at home. Stephen visits Mr Bounderby regarding the annulment of his woeful marriage. But Mr Bounderby decrees on the basis of conventional piety that this is impossible. Bounderby's decision depresses Stephen. Now Mr Gragrind presents to Louisa the business proposal of a marriage to Josea Bounderby remember that Bounderby is 30 years Louisa's senior 
Greg Grind uses statistics to prove that age difference does not result in an unhappy marriage. Luisa passively accepts the offer. The marriage takes place and the couple leave on their honeymoon. We also see emotional scenes between Luisa and Tom. In book two, entitled Reaping, we find Bitzer and Mrs. Parsit keeping watch for intruders at Bounderby's new bank. James Harthouse, who became an MP out of boredom, meets Bounderby. He is bored by Bounderby, but notices Louisa's melancholy nature. Louisa's brother Tom, who works for Bounderby, becomes increasingly wayward and suffers a moral decline as the narrative progresses. But he takes a liking to James Harthouse and reveals to him many secrets concerning Mr. Bounderby. Stephen refuses to join the trade union led by the orator Slackbridge, but his employer Bounderby dismisses him. A theft takes place at Bounderby's bank and circumstantial evidence points to Stephen. James Hothouse confesses his love for Louisa, but Louisa is restrained. He declines the offer of adultery. Louisa leaves for her father's house. When she reaches home, in an extreme state of grief, she reproaches her father for denying her an innocent childhood. She says that her rigorous education has stifled her ability to express her emotions. In book three, called Garnering, Mrs. Parsett passes on the news about Louisa's assumed adultery to Bounderby. He issues an ultimatum to Louisa to return to him before 12 o'clock the next day. When the request is not met, he restarts his life as a bachelor. Unlucky Stephen has an accident and dies after speaking to Rachel one last time. When Louisa and Sissy speak to Tom, he remorselessly reveals that he had actually committed a robbery which Stephen was accused of. Bounderby dies of a fit in the street. Tom also dies in the Americas after writing a penitential letter to his sister. Louisa herself grows old but never remarries. Mr. Grant Grant, of course, abandons his utilitarian philosophy. Dickens's novels are thematically very rich. Let us now explore the major themes of the novel Hard Times. The novel takes up the theme of fact versus fancy on its very first page. The opening words of the novel, spoken by Mr. Greg Grind, read as follows. Now, what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. Plant nothing else and root out everything else. You can only form the minds of reasoning animals upon facts. Nothing else will ever be of any service to them. This is the principle on which I bring up my own children. And this is the principle on which I bring up these children. Stick to facts, sir. Mr. Greg Grant is a spokesperson for rational self-interest and practicality. He denies any role for fancy or imagination. Imaginative or aesthetic subjects are completely removed from the curriculum of a school. No literature, no music, no poetry. But the fundamental contradiction here is that in expounding exclusive attention to fact, he uses metaphorical language. Plant nothing else and root out everything else. Remember that metaphorical language is associated with imaginative faculty. For Mr. Greg Grant, the circus represents fancy, but Dickens portrays it in a favorable light. Slary, the proprietor of the circus, believes that people must be amused. Sissy Jupe, who comes from the circus, is not apologetic about her imaginative faculties. 
Not surprisingly, she is the one who leads an emotionally fulfilling and a morally responsible life. Mr. Gragrand's children, Louisa and Thomas, fail in their own ways. Louisa, trained to repress her emotions, enters and walks out of a loveless marriage. Upon returning to her father's house, she almost suffers a nervous breakdown. Tom, her brother, also trained in analysis, deduction and mathematics, suffers a terrible moral decline and ends up in burglary. Bitsa, who has adhered to Gragrind's principles, turns out to be an uncompassionate egotist. The dynamics of human life cannot be reduced to a set of material facts and statistical analyses. If the future citizens of a country are brought up on Mr. Gragrind's maxims, the result will be a highly mechanical society consisting of soulless individuals. Here, Dickens seems to be emphasizing the need for a holistic personality which possesses not only the capacity for reason and calculation, but also emotional sensitivity and aesthetic outlook. We have already seen how Dickens deals a heavy blow to the worldview and educational values associated with the Industrial Revolution. In this part, we look at how Dickens educates his readers about the miserable and exploitative conditions of factories in England, especially in industrial towns such as Manchester and Preston. Hard Times is set amidst the smokestacks and factories of Coketown. In Victorian England, the workers were forced to work for long hours for meagre wages under cramped, sooty and dangerous conditions. In hard times, they are referred to as the hands and are represented by characters such as Stephen Blackpool. They lack education and job skills and are therefore unable to bring about any change in their terrible living and working conditions. The hands are exhorted by a crooked trade union leader and orator named Slackbridge. This is symbolic of the situation in England. The workers are caught between the devil and the deep sea. Dickens turns the lens of his art to focus attention on the plight of the poor and to awaken the conscience of the reader. His tone is one of righteous indignation and anger. He also exposes the cause of the wide gap between the rich and the poor. In this case, the gulf between the factory owners and the industrial workers. The reason, the cause of this gulf is the unfeeling self-interest of the upper and middle classes represented by Josiah Bounderby. The emotional coldness of Greg Grind's daughter also shows that England itself has become a machine without feeling, without compassion, without values. The last theme we are going to discuss is integrity amidst adversity. In hard times, Especially in the character of Stephen Blackpool, Dickens confronts the assumption that prosperity and morality run parallel to each other. This is a notion the novel systematically deconstructs. In other words, the novel shows evidence against the prevalent notion that if you are wealthy, you are also ethical. Mr. Bounderby and James Harthouse who belong to the upper class are moral monsters. Bounderby has no moral scruples. He fires Stephen Blackpool for a novelty. Like Oliver Twist, Stephen is a character who is faced with every kind of misery and adversity. He belongs to the poor class. He has a drunken wife and a miserable home. He is isolated among fellow workers and is dismissed by his employer. He is unfairly suspected of robbing Mr. Bounderby's bank. Still, he maintains his integrity, his honesty and compassion. He fights corruption on all sides. 
he wants to earn an honest living he is keen on maintaining amiable relations between the factory owners and workers he is considerate towards everyone as opposed to steven tom who is the wealthy great grandson declines morally he degrades himself to the position of a burglar sissy joop is another moral exemplar in the novel she loves louisa deeply it is she who convinces mr harthouse to leave the town so as to spare louisa further trouble and mr harthouse bows before her moral conviction no wonder f r lewis in his book the great tradition called dickens's hard times a moral fable we have come to the end of the lesson we began with an introduction to charles dickens as an author we looked at his life and career discussed his major works we also had some information about the historical and intellectual background for the novel hard times then we had a critical plot summary of dickens's novel hard times then we moved on to the major themes of the novel uh in particular we looked at the themes of fact versus fancy and reason versus emotion then we discussed the theme of industrial england we ended with a discussion of the theme integrity amidst adversity hope you enjoyed the lesson thank you